Uh, next, we have Felix von der Sand. He joins us from Munich, Germany. Yeah. And uh, he is an expert on Croatian meats. He <laughs> loves Croatian food, so that's what he told me in, in yeah. secrecy. Now, I, now I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> Uh, and he, uh, he, half his company is from Osijek, and they went to Zadar uh, this, this year for a, a week-long vacation. So he's familiar with Croatia. Let's welcome him. Thank you very much. Dobar dan, everyone. Um, thank you for sacrificing your Saturday afternoon today. I'm glad still so many people here. Yesterday I thought, okay, on a Saturday. There won't be so many people here, but you're proving me wrong. wrong. I like that. Um, I'll try my very best not to make you regret that decision. Um, my topic today is I will talk about user experience design and how we can bake a brand into digital products with the help of neuroscience, behavioral economics, and why this is actually very important today. Uh, so, no, I'm supposed to introduce myself, right? Um, so I'm Felix, um, I'm from Munich. I founded Kobe, a digital agency, uh, now five years ago with a few other guys uh, in Munich. Today we are 35 people in Munich and beautiful Osijek, Slavonia. I guess there's some Slavonian people here today. Um, all right, um, to start off with, uh, give me a quick show of hands. Who of you has the feeling that the amount of information that we are processing or having to process today on a daily basis is just too much, it's getting overwhelming? Okay, that's what I was hoping for. There's some very resilient people here not raising their hands. Um, there's a lot of research on the information overload. It's just getting too much. We're always on. There's so many players trying to catch our attention and um, we're always uh, available and people are, s are trying to understand that our attention is a limited resource, it's not endless. Um, so uh, companies also understand that and that means that the battle for attention is on. There's so many players trying to get our attention, some businesses are making money with our attention like WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram, you're not paying for these products, you are the product, right? You're paying with your attention. So, um, and the winner in this battle attention are going to be the companies who are, uh, who will uh, accomplish to get as much attention from the users as possible. So, um, what's crucial for getting the user's at attention? This is a nice little research from uh, Watermark Consulting, and they are saying, okay, if you want to get the user's, user's attention if, and if you want to be successful, you have to have a great customer experience in the first place. And they uh, did some research, okay, w which are companies that have really a really good customer experience, and they, co they compared these to a standard and poor 500 index. So they made an index out of customer experience leaders, leading companies in customer experience, and compared this to standard and poor 500, which is the 500 biggest companies in the US, and also to customer experience laggards. So this means nothing but that if you invest in customer experience, you're going to be more successful in the stock market as a company. So investing in customer experience has a return on invest. You're going to be more successful. Accompanying this, the Design Management Institute looked at companies that put design, design thinking, customer experience design, user experience design at the heart of their company, at the heart of every thought inside their companies. And these are companies like, of course, Apple, very design driven, uh, Coca-Cola, Intuit, IBM, also Nike. The Nike CEO, he, used to, he started as a designer at Nike. So every designer, you can become a CEO at a big company. And they looked at these companies and made also an index and they said, okay, if you invest or if you put uh, um, design, if, if, if you give this a lot of power inside your company, you're going to be more successful than also a standard uh, index, a standard company. So this means also not only custom experience design, but design thinking. This all makes sense. It's not just for fun or for making users happy. This has, has a return on invest. This is for for businessmen, but enough of business. Um, we're at a digital conference, so we want to look at digital products. And what's user experience? It's what we experience when we use digital products. And using digital products, 
user experience is an integral part of the customer experience. Customer experience, like uh, on the uh, when, when I call a company and I, and, I, and I want to complain, that's customer experience. When I go in, uh, into a store at the point of sale, what I experience there, that's customer experience. When I write me emails back and forth with the company, that's customer experience. And what I experience with the digital product of a company, the user experience, that's, that's a very important part of the customer experience. But because these products, I'm using these every day. I'm interacting with a company on a daily basis, hopefully. So customer experience is the same as user experience. And both have to be brand experience. Because I'm interacting with a company on a point of sale, on, on the phone, via an email, or with the digital products. And, and of course, what I have, what, what I'm feeling there should match to what the brand of the company that's behind these products is telling me on all their communication channels. Accompanying that, Nielsen Norman, big research company, they said, most people cannot differentiate how they feel about the brand from how they feel about the experiences they have with that brand. Right? Users don't think in touch points. They don't think, oh, I had a great experience at this point of sale, but I really hate the customer hotline, and the, I like the commercial, but the digital product is crap. They don't think in touch points. They think, oh, I either like that brand or I do not like that brand. And the user experience of a digital product, if you think of great, uh, great apps, great websites, Airbnb, PayPal, for example, that they the positive experience we have with these digital products has a big impact on the brand and on the decision for or against the brand. So how can we build great brand-driven user, user experience or digital products, successful digital products? We first have to understand that interfaces are nothing but faces. It's a nice play of words because it's in English it works perfectly because faces is already part of the word interfaces. Imagine when you interact with someone, you're subconsciously trying to understand, okay, who is, the, who is this person? Why does he look the way he does? Why does she behave the way she does? What's the identity of this person? What does she or he mean to me? Yeah? Why, why, what's the identity behind this person? What's the story behind this person? And the very same happens when, when we interact with a digital product. We are trying to understand why does this product look the way it does? Why does it behave the way it does? Why does it talk the way it does? And what's the identity behind this thing? Why, what's the story behind this product? So every interface and every face tells a story, right? And if every interface tells a story, we should make sure it tells the right story. And what's the right story? Of course, it's the story of the brand behind this product. Because companies invest millions, trillions of dollars into building their brands, telling people why BMW is the right choice and not Audi or Mercedes or Porsche, or why you should buy this toothpaste and not that toothpaste. But still, so they're commu communicating their brand story in, on all of their channels. And still today, in most, in, not most, in some cases, the digital products of these companies tell a completely different stories to the, to the way they are designed or they behave. And that's, that's a bad thing. That should not happen. Because user experience is brand experience. So how can we make a digital product tell a brand story? I keep skipping, sorry. So that's where neuroscience and behavioral economics, some research findings come into play. Because a user's, user's interaction with a digital product follows some rules. Uh, and these rules are, that's very important, unconscious, and they are learned by everyone during the course of their lives. And to illustrate this, I have a quick question for you, a little test. Uh, you can make an estimation for yourself. How far would you guess are these two rocks apart from each other? And I have a little zip. You can think for yourself. So everyone, every one of you has probably a number in their heads, 100 meters, 200 meters. It doesn't matter. If I ask you now, how would you describe the relationship between those two people? You would probably say, OK, these this seems to be a professional relationship. They shake hands, they leave a certain space between them, they don't hug, they're not close friends. It's a professional, uh, cool, maybe distant relationship. Right? A anyone disagrees? <laughs> the interesting thing is, we're talking about a physical distance with the two rocks, 
talking about emotional distance between those, uh, when we talk about the, uh, the relationship between those two people. Physical distance and emotional distance are processed in the same brain area. There's just brain, so one brain area processing the mental concept of distance, and that's very interesting. We know this from our, from our, when, from, from our language. We say, okay, we're close friends. That doesn't mean my friend and I are standing next to each other each and every day. We're just using the physical concept of proximity to describe an em emotional relationship. We're saying, this guy has a razor-sharp mind. That doesn't mean he's cutting prosciutto with the mere power of his thoughts, right? We're just trying to describe, okay, he's very sharp, he has a very sharp thinking and he's able to divide thoughts into little chunks and build them back together. So we're talking about the mental concepts here and that's, that's, the, that's the core thing that I would try to, that I would try to uh, describe today. Because with these mental concepts we can play. So we have to ask ourselves, what have we learned to associate with physical distance? And that's just an example. If we look at, I have this nice little pointer here. If we look at this parliament, there's the speaker here. There's a certain amount of physical space around him. And then comes the audience. So there's physical distance right here. Between me and you, the audience, there's a certain amount of physical space. I'm also elevated from the floor, physically. All of these are physical, uh, these physical concepts are translated into emotional concepts, in, into the mental uh, uh, concept of distance in this case, and we have learned if there's between a subject or an object and the rest of the world, be it the audience, uh, the, the listeners here, if there's a certain amount of physical space, this subject or object at the time is uh, distinct, yeah? I'm exclusive, I'm, ex I'm excluded from you guys, you are one group, I'm up here, same here. And with this distinction and exclusiveness, there's also associated the concept of premium. If you think about kings back in the days, they would sit on their thrones, elevated from the floor, so they would be physically and thus emotionally higher than the, than the people, and they would have between them and the people a lot of space. This is for the people to understand, hey, this guy is exclusive, this guy is premium, and he's elevated, he's better than you. means we can use that. We can, we can take advantage of these mental concepts. If you look at Apple, and I will use Apple as, as an example throughout this talk because it's, they just do it, play this very, very well. They seem to know about this. Um, design drives perception. The way they position the Apple logo, it looks nice, but also if you look at all of their products, nothing comes close to the logo. There's always a, certain, a, big, a huge amount of space, a maximum amount of space between the logo and the environment. Why is that? It looks nice, yes, but if you look at all the luxury products, nothing comes close to the brand. Physical distance, emotional distance, distinction, exclusiveness, premium. And premium is a very important part of the Apple brand. Why would I pay 3,000 euros for a computer? that I can get for 2,000 euros or 1,500 euros. Because the Apple, Apple tells their potential and their existing customers on all communication channels, these products are premium, you need this uh, to be better. I mean, if, as a designer, if I buy a Mac, I'm just I instantly double as good as before, right? You all know this. So design drives perception. We're talking about, again, emotional distance, Physical distance, same brain area, talking about the mental concept of distance. So the way we design a product heavily influences the way it is perceived. To break it down, everything about, on, about a product, the logo positioning, the radiuses, the color, the material, everything is a signal that we decode into a mental concept. In this case, distance distinctions. Uh, exclusiveness. And of course, these mental concepts, they should go hand in hand with what the brand is telling on all the com uh, communication channels. Why would, the, why, wh why would this be a different story? This wouldn't make any sense. And because Apple is doing it well, I'm not an Apple fanboy, just, they just doing a really good job on this. If you surf to apple.com, there's maybe one MacBook, maybe three iPhones, I think that was the maximum. 
a little drop shadow, and only white space, distance. Why is that? Because they say, this is a premium product. Give me your money. And we say, yes, please. If you go to an Apple store, this is the only uh, image that, uh, that one is allowed uh, to use in, uh, in talks of the Apple store, but you all know it. You would go in there, there's a huge table, and they would put four MacBooks on it. Why would you do that? If you work at Media Market, you, you, you get fired for that, right? At Media Market, product, product, laptop, laptop, laptop. At the Apple stores, big, big table, maybe four, five, six products, and a lot of space around them. Why is that? Because they know, we understand, okay, there's, these things are premium, exclusive, distinct. Yes, I want to pay 3,000 euros. <laughs> and this, I mean, premium is not the only value of the Apple brand, right? They, they're one of the, um, there's not a lot of brands that manage to put premium and this like, lifestyle-ish, cool, creative, uh, um, brand appeal into into one brand. They just they uh, they got lucky. They got that history of these freaks building their computers, and um, uh, the, the the designers got a hold of it and they, they they claimed it. And today, it's I mean it's when you start um, as a designer in, at design school, you, you you cannot even buy a Mac because it's too expensive. But still, that's, that, that's what they managed to, to, to con convey as a brand message. These are premium products, and they make you 100% more creative, promised. And the, all the, this funky, creative uh, uh, part of the brand, for example, that's what they play in the corporate behavior. If, if you go to the Apple stores, okay, you have these products uh, staged like, like, like precious uh, things, and then you, you have the guys standing there in, in, in their blue t-shirts, and you know, it's kind of pre creepy sometimes. You feel like they want to go for a beer with you or something. Um, but they have this like cool, that they're these cool dudes that they obviously imported from California um, to hang out with you <laughs> and steal your money. Okay, I'm going to stop talking about money. Um, but this means not, nothing but uh, the analog products, what the customer experience in the stores, the experience when you surf apple.com, and on every touch point with the Apple brand, you feel this premium appeal, and that's very important to Apple. Um, and that means you have a coherent image um, on, uh, of the Apple brand no matter where you get in touch with Apple. And that's, that's what you have to do. I mean, they, they invest so much money into building their brand, um, and they are, yeah, they are delivering the brand message with, with the way they design their products, online, offline stores, et cetera. Wow, this is way too fast. So, when we talk of all of this mental concept, concepts, this is called conceptual consumption. We consume concepts through the way products are designed. That means we permanently decode our environment. We want to understand why is this product designed the way it is? Black, silver, uh, shiny, why is that? We're subconsciously trying to understand why products are designed the way they are. We want to understand the meaning behind the product. And to illustrate this, nice little uh, study that was conducted. Um, they did a blind test with people. They gave the people this, uh, a wine in this glass and a wine in this glass. And they asked the people, okay, which wine do you think is better and more expensive? Majority of the, of the test, he said, oh, yeah, I, I know a little bit about wine. <laughs> that one's better. Come on, you're not tricking me. Um, it was the same wine in both glasses. But what influenced their decision or their, their experience of the product was the vessel in which the wine was put in, right? What's the mental concept behind these two products, behind these two glasses? We have this thing, it's very elegant, finely designed. The wine is elevated from the floor, right? So what's in there must be something special in comparison to this bold, dumb thing. Um, down to earth, thick bottom, very robust, seems to be an everyday ordinary object. So what's in there can't be as good as this because this is elevated already. So again, the way we design products has a big influence on how the product is judged. And also how we uh, physically interact with the product has a big difference or a big impact on our judgment. 
Um, we're talking about embodiment here, if you want to Google it. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a big difference. Um, usually de deodorants um, were used with a so-called pinch grip, right? You would take the deodorant and do this and deodorate yourself. I don't know, is that correct? <laughs> I've never said that. Um, but what is X? X is a brand for young men. They would put deodorant on themselves and they, then they have to start running because all the girls come running after them because they smell so good. It doesn't work, I tried it. Um, X thought about, okay, how, how do young guys, young men, how, how do they want to use that the deodorant? And they are very like, powerful, they have too much energy, you know it. And of course they want to open that deodorant with a power grip, right? like a tool. Mechanical, nice. That's what young men like. So very powerful ma masculine interaction with the product. The embodiment told the same story as the X brand told, for example, in their TV commercials. The important thing is, I said it before, all of this is happening unconsciously. This is a model by uh, Daniel Kahneman. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize. He wrote a very, very big book on thinking fast and slow. I can only recommend this to understand you have um, no, you're, you have no conscious power. You're completely driven by your subconscious, more or less. Um, and he's saying, okay, the pilot, that's our, our conscious, conscious mind, has 40 bits only. That's just enough to follow and process what I'm saying, more or less. And all the work is actually done by our uh, subconscious mind, called the autopilot. It, it has 11 million bit processing power. So the autopilot is the instance that reads the story behind the products we design, and that's why we have to ca cater to the autopilot and really take care how we design things. Because, you know Paul Watzlawick? He said, one cannot not communicate. Even if I stand here for 40 minutes and just do nothing, you would think I'm a creep, but I will communicate something. That I don't want to talk, that I don't want to be approached, whatever. One cannot not communicate. That also means products that we put out there, they cannot not communicate. Once we put them out, they communicate something. It te they tell a story. So we cannot not design. Even the WannaCry virus triggers mental concepts and people go crazy about the bad design, the cheap color scheme of the WannaCry uh, virus. So no matter what I do, once I put a digital product out there, it tells a story and we have to be aware of that. And of course, this story, what should this story be? You're a designer, usually, or, or a programmer. You're, you are building products for a target audience, not for yourself. You're not an artist. So, of course, every pixel, every transition is a trigger for uh, a mental concept. And that mental concept should fit to, to the brand behind the product. So now you know about the power of mental concepts. I will leave you for 10 seconds, have a sip of water, and have you look at these three versions of a running app and think about, okay, which values, brand values based on mental concepts could be baked into these products with everything you have learned so far. I'm gonna solve it real quick. So with the left example, we have this um, yeah, ascending line. The line is going upwards. What does that mean in our Western world when something's gone from, from the bottom left to the top right? That's progression, that's dynamic, that's forward, that's good stock performance. So with this upwards showing line, we, can, we, uh, we encode a mental concept of dynamic, for example. If we want to say, okay, our brand is about being energetic, what color scheme what we use? Of course, is bright orange, because what have we learned to associate with energetic? That's when, when, when energy is set free, th there's like reddish, orangish uh, glow to, to things. So dynamic and energetic. In the example in the middle, we have this um, very, very bold font, right? Fat font type. It's, it's about to break out of this button. It's so, it's so, it's so strong sitting in there. And we have this dark uh, color scheme with a very high contrast. Yeah, what's the mental concepts behind this? Powerful, exclusive, progressive. Exclusive, I mean, that's a, 
that's um, um, that's a thing of of, of our um, cultural background. If 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 you look at, um, for example, um, luxury brands, they work with with black a lot. That's just something that has established over over the course of time. That's not like that's not encoded in in our brain naturally. That is something that was created by by humans uh, in our. Um, in, in, in our society, if, if you look at the uh, Asian cultures, uh, for example, white is the color of mourning, right? While here it is black. So black is mourning and luxury, that's actually weird. Um, okay, let's look at the last example. This is so cozy, there's not even one edge in there. It's all nice and round, pastel colors, soft edges. So this is so reachable, it's, it's, it seems all a, a lot lighter, like these human pastel colors, uh, more, more empathic. And what you recognize already, I, know, I don't know how many designers are here, but you know maybe the taste dilemma, right? When you are talking about a product that you designed, and then the CEO comes and says, I showed this to my wife. That's the moment where you close your laptop and cry and go outside, and yeah, she said, ah, she's a great designer, she doesn't like it. Make it red. Bullshit. What's, what's nice about this is we never talk about taste. We talk about, okay, what's this start button design, this start button design, this start button design. What's the mental concept behind it? Does it fit to the brand? And that's a very efficient way to talk about UI UX design. So, what I want to tell you is never start designing or even programming without thinking about what, is the what will be the story of this product. What's the company behind this? What's the brand behind this product? What's the story I want to tell with this product? That's why we usually should start thinking about what's, what's the brand? What are the brand core values? What's, so you, you can start building up a semantic map. And uh, this is just an example with three core values. I mean, brands are usually built on, on, on values, right? Uh, BMW has joy as their core value. Uh, Mercedes has sovereignty. Uh, I think Volvo is uh, safety. Um, so, so you start building your brand, maybe with three up to five core values, safety, empathy, ease, just as an example. And I, I will play, uh, play through this example with uh, the, these three core values. So you start with the semantic map of the brand, and you want to apply this to the user experience of the product that you're building. Then you go out and say, okay, what's the, just as the example with the, uh, with the physical distance and the emotional distance, what's the empirical knowledge of the brand core value ease? What have we learned in the course of our lives in our society, in the Western society, uh, to associate with a, with a value like ease? And of course, it's like ease is a certain lightness, transparency, a little bit of floating, uh, reduction, uh, low weight clarity, uh, simplicity. And uh, scientists say what fires together, wires together. We have just learned there was, there was neurons firing every time we heard, okay, lightness, ease, okay, that belongs together. Reduction, simplicity, ease, okay, that belongs together. Fire, 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 neurons fire. Um, we just have learned that again and again. The empirical knowledge for the core value dynamic is completely different, right? We have tension, power, agility, uh, maybe grace, this power and glow, uh, motion blur for, for speed, um, and usually forward, upward direction. That's our empirical knowledge, for example, just a quick example, for dynamic. Last but not least, empathy. What have we learned to associate with empathy? It's supporting each other, being on, having the feeling you're on the same level, you're understanding each other. Warmth, human closeness, proximity, community, being together, connection. Now comes a very important step. Now we have the empirical knowledge, so what we have learned to associate with certain values. Um, and now we have to translate this into codes, into design codes. But this is actually... Okay, these are easy examples, but if I ask you now, which value is that? Ease, dynamic, or empathy? Easy, right? Anyone having trouble? <laughs> We're talking about um, asymmetry, 
uh, asymmetry, progressiveness, uh, lines going upwards, we have a little bit of motion blur, uh, elements showing forward, these tension everywhere, these glow, high contrasts. Um, and of course, this is, these are the codes that encode the mental concept of, of dynamic. Let's play it through for the rest. Ease, of course, that's, an e that's also an easy one, it's lightness. Uh, just little colors, very bright, white, lots of white. Calm, floating elements. You can use a little bit of drop shadows to give it a low weight. Uh, very accessible and reduced. Um, also some, some, some transparency. And the last one was um, empathy. And you could tell this is a lot warmer in the color scheme, for example. Right? You have this, all these round elements, elements being, uh, being overlapping, being, being close to each other, um, yeah, going inside and outside of each other, connecting elements, uh, and elements being grouped close to each other. So now that's for the visual design. But also, what not many are having in mind yet, from my experience, are transitions and animations. If you design a product, the very same screen, or the very same two screens, and apply two different kinds of transitions to it, this can change the, uh, the perception of this product one, 180 degrees, right? And this ha also has to be driven by a brand, of course. Why, what else would it be driven by? So if you say you're BMW, and you're all about being joyful and dynamic, of course, in your transitions, you have to to work with these dynamic, bouncing, fast uh, transitions, and not if you're like a company that has uh, ease as one of their core values, it's more like, oh, this is a little bit fluffy, surprising, light animation. This has a very, very big impact. This is movement. This is what our brain is wired to, to put attention to when things move. So this has a big impact on, on the perception of digital products. Last but not least, um, the tonality of the textual content is also important. If I, want to, if I have a button and I want to tell people, okay, this thing is on, if your brand is very empathic, uh, um, is all about empathy, you might put there, I'm awake, to establish a kind of human connection between the, this thing and the user. If you're a bank and you're all about reliability, security, clarity, uh, transparency, you can put there, I'm awake, that would be a little, okay, I know, this, this, what is this? You would put their core status online. There's one and zero, all right? This is online or offline. There's no, there's no empathy here. Banks don't want empathy. All these decisions have to, do, to be driven by a brand. And why is, it, why is this also important? This is a model by Professor Mark Hassenthal in German, Hassenthal. Um, and he says, okay, digital, uh, digital products, they have a pragmatic quality, and they have a hedonic quality. And what I'm telling you is that the pragmatic quality, that it works flawlessly, that it has perfect usability and utility, that is a must-have today. You can't put a product out there that has bad usability. It's a hygiene factor, right? And it's not a differ different differentiation factor to have great usability. It just, you have to deliver this today. In addition to that, uh, high quality in aesthetics has also become a must-have more or less, driven by uh, uh, Apple with their design language, Google Material Design, all the big uh, startups, Airbnb, Uber, they have great aesthetic quality. And you can't put products out there with a mediocre aesthetic quality. That will make you fall behind. So how can we achieve um, relevance and differentiation that people want to use my, my, my product at all and they build, uh, that they build an emotional relationship with the product only with the hedonic quality? And this can only come from the brand, building uh, user experience and user interface design derived from a brand. So the hedonic quality makes the difference in the end if your product will be successful or not. This has to be, this, has, this is given, uh, high visual and aesthetic quality is also given. This, this can make the difference for a um, successful product or not. Okay, now we're saying, oh yes, nice talking and stuff, but have you actually done this? Yes, I brought an example for you. This is the Hypo Finance Bank, it's called in Germany. Here it's called Zagrebačka Banka, I guess. It uh, belongs to Unicredit Group. Uh, and they had a brand repositioning a couple of years ago. They said, oh, all our clients are pretty old, they're dying out. Uh, we have to think about something. Um, 
how about we become a premium bank? So our new core value is aspiration. If you're a premium aspirational customer, you can come to Hypo Finance Bank. We're the, we're the go-to guys. Yeah, we're a premium bank now. So they put premium and aspiration at the core of their identity. They would now... Uh, too fast. Okay, spoiled this one. <laughs> So on all their co communication channels, on all the billboards, they would talk about competence, being premium. Uh, here they're saying, when something's wrong, my husband is the second person I call. First person is my Hypofines Bank guy. All right. Hypofines Bank are the go-to guys, right? They put a lot of marketing pressure out there to communicate this new premium positioning and ambition. So I think, okay. I might be a premium customer, premium bank, I like that. Let's check the App Store. And that's what they find. That's like Windows 95 style at its best, 1.5 star rating, lol. Okay, spot that one anyway. That's no premium, that's no aspiration. That's just a big problem for the brand because I can tell the nicest story on all of my communication talents. If I don't deliver in my digital products, it doesn't make sense. HVB understood that, so we helped them rebuild their product. And as you can see, uh, just as an example, there's a lot of white space here. That's actually wasting space, but that's, for, that's because of the mental concept of distance that I have talked about in the very beginning to encode this, uh, this premium appeal. Then, of course, empathy is, is also an important part of the Hypofines Bank brand. And um, so we can, for example, in the content, work with uh, um, uh, the grandpa with his grandson. So m more, m many generations sitting close to each other, a lighter, uh, uh, a warm tone of the, of the photography and stuff. So pixel by pixel, transition by transition, animation by animation, the brand is put together in every interaction I have with this digital product. So what we want to accomplish is that we actually can argue every pixel with the brand value. And that's, that makes the process of designing UI and UX and talking about it and, uh, and making decisions you know, on, on the way to a, to a good product uh, way more efficient. And yes, we managed to go from 1.5 stars to 4.5 stars. That's okay, I'm talking a little bit about ourselves <laughs> and the good job we've done. Um, but what I really liked is that one, one, one user rating was, f was, I think, five stars, and they said, this finally feels like a premium product. And we did not buy this one. Um, <laughs> we bought other ones, but this one I really liked. Uh, and that has to be the goal for user experience design, right? Putting the brand in every pixel and making the people feel, okay, yes, premium, uh, uh, Hypo Bank premium, yeah, I feel this, this kind of fits to me. And yes, the product feels the exact same way. The product delivers on the brand a message. So I'm closing down with saying, actually today, only brand-driven user experience can create uh, emotional relationships. Because I'm picking a brand. Uh, it, picking a BMW over an Audi is not a rational decision, even if you think. It's a, it's, it's a brand decision, usually. And that's why it's so important to design user experience brand-driven, because it then all makes sense in the user's mind. It makes users feel connected to the product. And emotional relationships between the user and the digital product create relevance and attention. And that's what you want to achieve today to create successful digital products. If you want to dive deeper into this topic, I suggest you have a look at this little textbook that we uh, published this, uh, this spring. And we're currently researching with the Uni University of Ingolstadt in Germany on actually validating this method. So right now we're saying, hey, uh, uh, here's your brand value. We put this in the product. Here it is. It's awesome. And it's kind of common sense the way we, dis we, we do this. But we, want, we, want, we really want to prove it. So what we're working on is putting a, a banking app like the Hypo Finance Bank into, uh, into a panel, a user test, and at the end it pops out, okay, what the users associate with when they use that product is really the brand core values. But that's some way to go. Voila, that's it. Thank you very much for listening. I have the first question. All right. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned the pilot versus autopilot and an author's name, but you said it very quickly. What was that author's the name? The author? Yes. Uh, Daniel uh, Kahneman. One more time? 
Daniel Kahneman. Kahneman. It's, it's, can it's can from, you tweet it's, it out? I, 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 I can say it in German, but yeah. I don't know how to pronounce it. it. It's a German name, but he's, he's American. Okay, I don't uh, know. Yeah, if you could tweet that, that would be great, because then I can just copy-paste. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions? Okay. Hi, great talk. I uh, just you. wanted to ask, is the book available in English or is it, or is it German only? Very good question. We're working on the English version and it will be pu published probably mid, n mid of next year. And it will also include all the research part that we're doing right now. So the, um, yeah, the validation of the method more or less. Uh, hey, so my question is, uh, I, I like to talk and I enjoy the process, but how does uh, user testing, iteration, and uh, all of that come into play in, into that process. How we put that in, into the process? Okay. Um, so it's, it's important to understand that we actually need uh, to, to, to build successful products, we need two routes. We need, need the user-centered route, where we really uh, like do design thinking, look inside the user's heads, and meet them at home, how they, how they deal with their financial stuff before we even think about an app or, or something. That's, that's the one route, and then build a product and, and, and iterate together with the user and make it, make it work perfectly. And then comes this route that I was talking about, um, and th this, is, this is about how, how the about the subconscious um, yeah, feelings that, that, that arise when, when uh, users are uh, interacting with this product. So you have the user-centered route, and the other route is, is the brand-driven route. And I mean, this is, this is, th th there's so much research about the uh, user-centered route. And um, yeah, as I said, we're trying to really prove that the way we design from, from, from a brand-driven perspective really triggers the mental concept that we that we uh, aimed to do. Did that answer your question? That was a long... Uh, I, was going, like, I was kind of thinking, how, how, do you merge these two routes, or, or like they're completely different, in your opinion? Yes, but um, right now we say, okay, um, you, you have to design this way to, to, to trigger the, the, the brand values, but we not... Um, yeah, I mean, it, this goes in, into the first concept that we do. We show this to to users, like the MVP version, um, but we don't test the design language yet. I mean, it's 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 just a it's it's a it's a toolbox, right? Um, right now, you you design your first MVP and then you go out and test it, and it has a nice design because you're a good designer. We're designing also a nice design, but it's brand driven. I mean, we can't prove it yet, but it's just it, it's a design language at the end with some um, yeah theoretical background underneath it. Other questions? Right here. Uh, yeah, great talk, by the way. Uh, I have a question. Yesterday, I don't know if you attended the talk of Jenny Shen, and yes. she talked about how culture dictates design. So I was wondering when the things you were talking about, does that include that thing, or does it exclude? Is it just purely neuroscience, or does it include culture, the way people think in a certain culture. That's, that's, a, that's a very important part. Um, if, if, just if, if you're thinking, if, if you're reading from left to right or from, from right to left, ascending lines are going this way or this way. So yes, we're also planning to do, re I mean, we're right now designing for the Western uh, we're, uh, customer base. Um, but we're, we, we're also planning to do research, okay, what are the implications of other cultures and what are the mental concepts of other cultures? What do they associate with uh, certain values? Um, that will be very interesting because you can't just, um, yeah, I mean, the big companies are doing this, but I also believe um, when it comes to mental concepts, you can't just take a, a design that works in, in Central Europe and put it to China. Um, for example, just the concept of, or, of luxury and precision that is, is completely different in, in, in China than it is in Europe. We have this German engineering thing, and um, for them, luxury is more like, like pretty wild <laughs> compared to what we think is luxury. Great. Uh, that's all the time we have for questions. Thanks again, Felix. Thank you.